for Mr. B. Slade to pop into the room. I'll be talking to him about a new project that he just produced with Auntie Shirley Ralph called Slay. It's a Christmas album. Surge, what's going on, brother? Y'all be going ham in our little legends uh, inbox, the DMs. Y'all go ham. <laughs> I'm waiting for Mr. Uh, B. Slade to pop into the room. There he is. Hey there. Brother. How are you? How are you? I'm blessed. I know that's right. I would say so. I, I Before we even get started, I just want to say I appreciate you for your time and your energy. You don't have to do this, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Truly, I am. This is this is exciting, exciting times for me these days. So good, 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 good. So uh, I, I guess I want to start off by giving you your accolades. Um, me personally. I think that there is nothing that you can't do musically. I think that you are probably the epitome of uh, uh, a consummate musician. I think that there's nothing that you can't do. It's my opinion. <laughs> I think anything I put my mind to and I work at, I can do. Yeah. yeah. I'm just very, I'm a very, lazy productive producer and artist i'm very lazy but if i start something i'm going to see it through some people have the vision for albums and videos and stuff yeah i actually see it through so i'll say i work at things and then i get better at things and then y'all get the best of me working at it <laughs> i like that i'll take that so let's start off with what was your first musical inspiration what was what, what happened to you to make you say yeah music uh hmm well walter hawkins for number for, for number one uh the love alive album was very that was like the first thing i heard i won't be satisfied and when i heard that la 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 I was just like, first of all, this doesn't sound like any type of gospel I've ever heard. Just melody wise, it seemed more like a pop song from the seventies, you know, like some mm -hmm. like like some Carpenters type stuff. So as a kid, that really intrigued me. So that's that's what pretty much got me going. That and institutional radio choir, okay, like this really really fast Brooklyn shout music for me. Yeah. Like if it wasn't yeah. fast, then I didn't want to have nothing to do with it. If it was slow, it had to really be oily. But I preferred, you know, up tempo, uh, East Coast, Brooklyn in particular, institutional radio choir, like real fast joints used to get me yeah. going. <laughs> well, how, how old were you around that time, like when that was hitting? Mm, well, it came out, uh, that particular album, Love Alive, came out the year I was born. And, um, the institutional came out a year after I was born, but I, of course, I was too young to hear it until my father taught me, rest his soul, taught me how to play 
vinyl for myself. Like you taught me to like mm-hmm. clean the needle and made mm-hmm. sure that I treated the albums with respect that I, I, yeah. I blew both sides of the, you know, then you put a, there used to be a little, um, <clears throat> like a little arm that you put on top of the vinyl to keep it in mm-hmm. place until it settles down on the turntable. Yeah. And he just yeah. taught me how to respect every aspect of not just enjoying the music, but how you take care of the music if you appreciate it. So I think those That's details true. and that care and, and respect for just the, the actual object itself was the beginning of my love affair with the details of the scientific approach I take to music too. But I used to listen to everything on vinyl at 45, not 33 and a third. It was too slow for me. So a lot mm-hmm. of my input of thousands and thousands and thousands of albums, gospel and mainstream, because my brothers was basement, they all had all the Parliament and Prince and, you know, Confunction and Gap Band and all that stuff. So I didn't see a difference between how they both made me feel. I didn't right. feel like I should have had to have chosen between upstairs or downstairs. And right. I would input all of that material at 45 RPM. And mm-hmm. I wanted to get more information in my head. And it took too long at 33 and a third. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I like That's- the way they sounded. I still like that Alvin and Chipmunk sound now. I use, I use it in my songs still. I love hearing things too fast. I really like that stuff. <laughs> What's so funny is when I when I was a kid, my dad had the component set, and I couldn't really man, you know, I couldn't touch it without him. So uh, correct, because that was like, taboo. You don't do that. You don't do that. <laughs> yeah. And so my godmom, because she knew I liked music, she bought me a Super Friends little little. Uh, it was like a little record player with a little speaker on it. Yep, Super Friends. That was mine. <laughs> yep. Super Friends. And I would um, ask my dad if I could borrow certain albums of his. And okay. he would give me the, the less popular ones, like the ones that oh, if okay. I had, then it, would it, ain't go, it ain't gonna hurt him too bad. <laughs> right. right. But, you know, just having the access to be able to play my own music. And then soon after that, I was pretty young. Maybe, I guess, when I started working, like 14 years old, I started buying my own music. Then I would play it Same. on my own record. That was the year I bought my own first albums at 14. I actually, I actually went to my brother's. Um, he had this <laughs> his sparklets bottle or Culligan's um, water bottle that had a bunch of money in it that he would just put his spare change in. But sometimes there'd be like ten dollars or twenty dollars or whatever in there. And I wanted this tape so bad it was um, uh, <laughs> Rhythm Nation. I wanted it so bad I was thirteen, fourteen, and so I was like, man. I got to get this tape. So I went into his spare change jar and got that $10 bill. And I, I totally stole from my brother to get that music. I totally did. I told him about it. So I, I because it, that's crazy how music is so addictive. You'll actually, you'll do things to get yeah. certain people's albums. When it's, when it's a real album, yeah. it's like crack. It's like crack or like you just doing something really bad because that music is so, you need it so bad. It's your hit. It's your fix. It's how you get through the day. It's how yeah. you get it through the get through the night. Like direct, people don't get it. It's a direct pipeline into your soul. It's a direct yeah. pipeline into your soul. Yeah. Yeah. And it's ironic because I I was just reading uh, Michael K. Williams' book, and he mentions that Rhythm Nation album and how it put him on a trajectory for him to even go into the arts. That yeah. was very beautiful. No, that's why I became a recording artist because of Rhythm Nation. Yeah. Wow. I was on the I was on the fence of doing. The bad thing for protection or the mm-hmm. right thing for elevation. And that album pushed me when I was on the fence, it pushed me on the right side of things. So that's why that wow. it's not just Janet Jackson, it's just what the message was and how the production was at the time. Super industrial, hard hitting, very new Jack Swing, and I'm a heavy Teddy Riley protege and fan. Mm-hmm. Um and uh Rich Harrison, you know, for that whole go go DC, very yeah. heavily percussive vibe. You found a lot of that in Rhythm Nation. So it hit me as a producer. It hit me as a young person concerning my education, making sure that I I had the knowledge and it's nice to laugh and don't be the joke. You know, it just, it was smart. It made me step up everything. And that's when I decided to become a recording artist. So that, yeah, I wanted that thing so bad. I I took from my own brother. (laughs) Stuff so good I had to steal from my big brother. (laughs) Oh, boy. When did you know that you had a voice and you could actually sing? 
I knew for many years, but I hid behind the drums for a long, 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 long time. Just like Karen Carpenter, she hid behind the drums for a very, very long time. And I, I was fine with the drums, you know? I was, I started off with pots and pans and, and tambourines and things of that nature. And I remember being really young playing like, you know, 30 second triplets, 16 triplet type passes on like skin tambourines. Like it, mm-hmm. it was syncopation. Everything came very, very easy for me. So I hid behind that because I felt like I didn't have to say anything, but I knew how to sing since mm, probably four or five. I started singing, but I didn't want my parents to know. So I feel like being out in the front. A singer has to sing. A true singer has to sing. A true singer has to sing. So how would you get that out? Like, if you didn't want them to know, when would you sing? When they either weren't around or they weren't really paying attention to me. I mean, I was making beats every day, all day. You know, by the time I was 10, I was full out producing like full tracks like programming and everything. So I was like a little prodigy or whatever. I was just, I just love computers. I was kind of like a nerd, very geeky. I was into process more than product. Okay. And so I liked hiding behind the technology or hiding behind the physical protection of the armor of a drum set. Like it it protects you. It's like, when you sit behind a drum set, like you might as well have a tank because... (laughs) This is your domain. You run this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like the pulse of everyone's breakthrough is in your kick drum and in that that snare and in them high sounding cymbals. That's where the yokes are destroyed. That's when people start dancing on the floor. It's that drummer, right? So why come from behind that to start singing in front of people when I could just hide behind that gift? And then one Sunday, they asked me to, my mom heard me singing and she, and so we went to a visiting church. It was this rock apostolic church. It was Pastor Rennick's Graham. And I was about mm, six or seven, probably closer to seven. And I sang institutional, <clears throat> institutional radio choir. I sang, uh, and my eyes was closed tight, man. I didn't want to see them people, man. I, <laughs> I look at myself now with how I can, like, I'm still very introverted off stage. On stage, when the band is behind me, I turn into, you know, the whole B-Slade thing. It kicks in. Yeah. But for real, I don't enjoy, like, singing Happy Birthday at really small birthday parties. That's the anxiety city, bro. I, I can't, wow. I'd rather be on a big stage than have to do, like, a smaller solo in front of a small group of people. It really makes me uncomfortable. So that Sunday, I sang, uh, when Jesus cracks the sky. I'll tell this whole world goodbye. I'm going to a better place. Yeah, anyway. So I sang it and uh, kept my eyes closed. And I just remember them, you know, sing, boy, sing, you know. And I was like, okay, cool. And I was over it, right? (laughs) Then the next time was a few years later when I turned nine. And the stakes were higher because... I had to, somehow, I ended up singing at the Council for the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, the uh, Southeastern District Council, which is a big deal. A lot of churches from the southern uh, part of California and sometimes northern would come visit too. And they had me do a solo. And in that solo, I sang Vanessa Bell Armstrong's uh, uh, Amazing Grace. Shall always be my song of praise. Mm-hmm. For it was grace that. Yeah. Anyway, she influenced all that riffing and running stuff. That was all yeah. Vanessa. Vo- and then uh, sec- I remember singing this part in particular at the council. And I said, but I was way up higher than this. I'm just don't feel like going there now. Imagine the octave of this. Amazing grace shall always be done. Wow. The the anointing kicked in. I felt it. Mm. <laughs> and then um you see, 
for it was grace and mercy. And then <clears throat> I closed my eyes, but I was singing directly to the Lord, bro. I was like, I can get tears right now thinking like just where I was singing that from. Wow. Did why he came to love me so? But he, 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 he it was over. And it it was over. <laughs> I let that like I felt the Holy Ghost, man. It was just like it was like electricity. It was fired like yeah. It was fire coming up out of me, man, just singing to God directly in front of thousands of people. Mm. But I kept, at that time, I was still very shy. So I kept my eyes closed the whole time. But I did sing with my whole heart. Wow. And then that's when I was like, okay, I think I do want to sing more. So I started singing with my family group. And we recorded this song called... Uh, hog pen experience and you need the master it was a b a and a b side um and i wrote a lot on there and i did tambourine okay. percussion and stuff my brother produced it kent um, my mom was in the group myself my dad played sax on one of the songs but he actually wasn't a part of the group and you know this <laughs> i like the songs and stuff I, I just remember my older brother couldn't be there for some of the mixing sessions and my dad was like, well, what should we do? And so I knew how to produce at that age, at 10. I knew how to, even though he wasn't there, I knew I could handle the responsibility in his stead. And I remember my father and I got into a conflict about a production choice that I felt, you know, he was coming from his James Brown area and I'm coming from like, Michael Jackson type vibes or something, you know, which is, you know, I get it because Michael Jackson's DNA comes from James Brown. He is the right. offspring of James Brown. Prince is the offspring of James Brown. Mm -hmm. But I was just trying to, like, in the mix of this family song, I was trying to, like... Insert yourself. Insert myself. But I was yeah. too young. It was like I was too young to be taken seriously. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, it was like I, I felt... Did you I get a lot played of a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Like one time we was at choir rehearsal and the guy who was teaching, this was at my father's church, my mom's church. This is before they had a church. And this is when we were going to an, another church, home church. And that director was teaching uh, Nothing Shall Separate Me. And the inversions that he was teaching the Sopranos was all wrong. And I knew this at eight. And so I called my mom out the choir stand. I was like, Mom, come here. She's like, what, boy? <laughs> called her down to me because I would always be at choir rehearsal. All the other kids be playing and stuff. I'd be zoned, making sure them parts is right. <laughs> so I was like, mm -mm, I ain't how the record go. I would I remember. So my mom came down. She says, what? I said, Ma, that note that he's teaching them sopranos, that's the wrong inversion. He's he. He had them up in the Raptors, and it that's not where it was supposed to be. That's the, that he was teaching the Sopranos the tenors note in mm. this particular inversion, but he didn't catch that. So the Sopranos was getting pissed off, like, "Nigga, where you got us all up in the sky like this?" And I'm thinking out there because he has y'all up the wrong note. That's the wrong inversion. So I told my mom. She said, "Don't you say nothing. You just sit here and think about it. Think about what that this is going to be <laughs> awful Sunday. We need to fix this now." What is the problem? Don't he hear it? Don't you hear it, Ma? Well, the altos are kind of high. Exactly. So let's fix this now. <laughs> so that was, that was, I always preferred adult conversation. I always preferred adult vocabulary. I always loved talking to older people, hearing their wisdom, their stories, their insight. I wasn't really terribly interested in, with my peers. Yeah, not like old, not like old. I thought I was better than them. I just didn't. Their conversation didn't in interest me, like mature folks. Right, right. Uh, you're an old soul. I mean, mm -hmm. some, but I'm silly. I'm silly too. I'm silly. I'm crazy silly, nuts. But yeah, I prefer the company and conversation of people who've had some wisdom and some experience. And that's fair. I mean, yeah. you, you, you want to surround yourself with people that are of the like, but can also help you grow. I, I don't understand when people don't want to speak to someone who's older than themselves. They, they have no interest. As if you won't. 
be that age yourself someday. God willing. And, and we talk so much about older people until we become the age we used to think was old. And you realize right. it's not old at all. Exactly. Exactly. It's, so, if, anything, if anything, I feel that I've become better as an artist because of experience. Of course. At, at least that's the way it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you're paying attention and doing it right, it's supposed mm -hmm. to go that way. Oh, huh. So, huh. Your venture into... One second, I pray for this food. Okay. I've been into it before I prayed. All right. Go ahead. Got to forgive you. Yes, he will. He's here with me now, enjoying it. <laughs> so when you when you step into becoming an artist on your own and creating your own sound and your own music, what's that journey like for you? Mm. That, you that you're Lots finally movies. Yeah. What, what's your main? What's phrase your whole question? Questioning. I make sure I'm answering so, properly. So we we come from a place where you're you're trying to create and people keep trying to hold you back because you're too young, and yes. now a place where you can create your own music and you don't have to have that where what's your mindset then well how are you are you going in like a beast or are you yeah, like i'm yeah. losing it i'm losing it brother <laughs> it's so funny uh one of my musical sensei's jack quest cool name mm -hmm. i knew I, I knew he's gonna be my mentor with a name like jack quest and jack quest who i spoke to today ironically what's up rob milton one of my favorite people in the world uh he just joined us today, so shout out to him. Uh, he used to come over and bring in, in Sonic uh, ESQ1. So he was the first person that introduced the concept of sequencing, that I could layer multiple sounds mm. by myself without the need of having musicians come in. Mm. And once he unlocked that door, bro, and I was able to do different parts and sequences and arrangements, I mean, the drums weren't that fantastic, but for the time... And it, but the keyboard sounds were really good, mm -hmm. and and you know it had a ROM card like a little cartridge with extra sounds and things of that nature, and that began my love affair with Insonic, period. Like from the Mirage to the ASR10 to the TS10, which I did all of uh, pronounced on Aeon. So, okay. uh, but it started with the ESQ1 and Jack Quest, and he showed me how to, and he used to always tell me. <laughs> Even back then, he's like, man, you're you're an incredible, you know, whiz kid. He's like, but, man, you got so many changes and so many parts in your songs. And I was just like, we probably ain't going to be working together too much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you what I was on even back then. I'm going to tell you. Wow. My, my, remember I told you I was in the family group and we released Hog Pen Experience, B-Side of You Need the Master. I cover You Need the Master on Oak Park 92105. So that's my nod to my family group. But by the time I got to 13, I had a meeting with the family group. And I was just like, hey, yo, <laughs> I don't think this group thing will work out. I'm going to go solo. And I'm not going to be Anthony no more either. I'm like, what are you about to be? I was like, Tone. <laughs> <laughs> So I got the idea from that group, uh, Tony, Tony, Tony. And right. the third Tony was spelled with a T-O-N-E and it had a little accent mark over it. And I was right. like, that was the one that stood out the most. So I was like, I don't want to be that. And <laughs> and their names ain't even Tony. Mine right. is. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, okay, cool. But then I was like, no, they're going to think that I'm a part of that group. And and, <laughs> and back in when Tony first was popping, a lot of people was like, oh, I enjoyed you in that group, Tony, Tony, Tony. I'm so glad to see you gave your life to the Lord. I'm like, look, ma, I'm not even, I wasn't even in the group. What are you talking about? I gave my life back to the Lord. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm like, no, no. The, you know, so then I said, I'll add the X. I saw the name Thibodeau or yes. Papado somewhere. Yeah. Real. Yes. And so I was like, the fact that the X is not pronounced is kind of fly. Yes. You see it, but you don't say it. It's like sin. It's there, but nobody talks about it. You feel me? That part. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, but it's the EX. We are all in X something. We just don't talk about it all the time. So mm -hmm. that's why I thought Tone, the name was kind of clever because it represented 
so many of us who was growing up in church at the time who were starting to grow up and see that everything wasn't quite as like cracked up the way we were taught it was to be when you get into the real world outside of your church hyper bubble, which I'm grateful for because that foundation wouldn't let me go. But so far, you know, right. I had a good anchor while I was out in, in mainstream that I never compromised my belief or my walk. And I never went so far, but so far because that right. anchor was just, it's, it's important to have a foundation, but it, it shouldn't be a noose. Right. You know, it's good to have the foundation to build upon so that when the winds of life come and the storms of life come, you, you won't fall. Cause, cause, cause Los Angeles and Hollywood, the whole thing is, it's a grand illusion at best. And it's, it's so ironic that a lot of people don't <laughs> see it that way. It's, it's really ironic. They, they take everything, you know, as the truth and for real, and it's not really that way at all. Mm -mm. And, and I, then, I, think I think it, it took me being raised the way I was raised to yeah. survive mainstream Hollywood successfully. Mm. Yeah. And then before you, before you even get to Hollywood, which some people don't know, in certain aspects, when you're even singing in, in the gospel world, when you're, when you're touring and you're, and you're actually making money in that mm -hmm. capacity, you can mm -hmm. kind of at, <laughs> with the guys of the Lord over it. Yes. Yeah. I still feel funny about that, you know, it's like, it's weird, it's like, how does someone charge anyone for a sermon when you didn't come up with any of the script? Mm. You're just reiterating something that's already written in your tone, in your personality, in your style. There's nothing wrong with it, but how do we yeah. really take credit for that? Right. <laughs> how do we really say, hey, I'm going to charge you for this book that was already written, but I just said it a little bit differently. It, it mm -hmm. always, not, and I'm not coming at anyone. You know, we all, you know, I just think about these things. Yeah. You know, and, and, the, and the sad part is people think that God stopped writing at Revelation. He's still speaking. We are living epistles. He's still writing testaments and documents through our life. But, but the question is, are you listening? That's the question. It's hard to listen when you're listening to an echo. You're not mm. hearing the main, you're hearing an auxiliary plug-in. Mm. You're hearing something that's went through a manipulated chassis and side chain, but you're not getting the direct signal. Wow. Wow. When he talks, the music tells you exactly what to sing. When he wow. talks, he tells you exactly what to speak and what to preach. Because it's not from us. It's through us, bro. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so when you arrived, arrived. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> and and you're like you you're 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 tone, you're there, you're 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 making the music, you have the accolades, you know, people are adoring you for your talent. You know, you're you're on demand. What it is felt that great. Word? It felt great. It felt yeah. amazing. Yeah. Oh, it felt so good. Because I knew I was doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. I was just making the album I wish I could buy. Yeah. I'm a Fred Hammond head, bro. Yeah. I'm a commission head, man. He was edgy to me. The winers was cool, but commission was way edgier, period. Yeah, well. Until yeah. the winers did its time, then they started like flexing. I was like, all right, that's what I'm talking about. But <laughs> commission was already on that wave, you know. So that's where a lot of this edge as Tone at the time came from. There was Donald Lawrence influence, Bible stories was was definitely opened my eyes up to how I could flex myself as a gospel artist in the way I express myself fashion wise. Right. Because he was the first person, a first male gospel artist I knew that was rocking two earrings. I was like, oh, so that's what we doing, Donald? <laughs> Bet. Next album, I'm doing me too. <laughs> Pronounce Tone, I had two hoops. That's all <laughs> Donald Lawrence's fault. So if any of y'all got a problem with Tone, blame it on Donald Lawrence. <laughs> so, so during that time, would you have like some of the church elders try to reel you in? 
to try to talk to oh, you. Oh, yeah, they try to shame me, make me feel bad, you know. Yeah. And I'm sure that a lot of jealousy was attached to that, too. Yes, some of it was, I wish I could be as free as you. Yeah. Um, I resent the fact that I didn't have the balls to be myself and love right. the Lord. They're not right. seen as a contradiction. Like, they try to make, like, God uses people's individuality and personalities and sense of humor and all these things to bring light and joy to other people. That eccentricity, that thing that makes you different is usually the thing you're bullied about or attacked for mm -hmm. or embarrassed about or ostracized over. That very special gift is the main thing people attack because they don't want you to tap into that source. So I remember leaving church. I just got my ears pierced. And, you know, a good friend, you know, there's it's, it's no beef or nothing like that. But he did come up to me and say, I'm really disappointed in you, man. I'm like, why? He's like, I just can't believe you did that. Look how you was raised. Man, you, you supposed to be saved. You apostolic, man. You feel with the Holy Ghost. What you doing with earrings in your ear, man? I was just like, I'm just doing me. I said, I still love God. So I said, I'm, I said I'm, I'm still on fire. And I said, I can't believe you coming at me like this. I said, I, I said, I thought we was cool, but nah, man, your parents, I'm sure they're embarrassed. And my dad was not happy with it, but I was 18. You know, it's like, how, how long are you supposed to keep somebody in a hyper bubble where y'all change the rules whenever you want to, according to whoever the person is and don't stick to a particular thing? I don't mind the rules. Right. As long as everybody plays by them, I don't mind our country with its rules, as long as everyone plays by those rules. So that made me want to go even harder <laughs> in being myself. It didn't make me retreat. It made me want to define myself as an artist that much more. Right. <clears throat> and that's difficult to do, being raised apostolic. Your choices are very limited as to how you express yourself. But it was there. It was there. I couldn't deny that this. I remember my dad, I went to church for Easter one time. You know, Easter was a really big deal. That was when you bust out your like bomb outfit. You know what I'm saying? Yes, like sir. people be playing, trying to act like, oh, we didn't come here for form and fashion. You liar. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Because we used to get that whole outfit. It took you sometimes a week to get ready for Easter Sunday just to get it right, including haircut and, you know, grooming and everything else. Listen, if you're not late for Easter Sunday, you might as well not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Don't even show up, bro. That is like the Met Gala of, like, church. You know what I'm saying? It's like. What, what an offering takes, what, like two hours to do the oh, offering? Because yeah. everybody what? walking around. Back then, we used to. It might as well have been a runway, man. I Every Sunday, it didn't even mean to be Easter. I'd just be checking out people's outfits. Like, man, they killed that today. You know, you, you're giving your offer, but you're also trying to set off some of that outfit, too. So I just remember wearing Miami Vice was really popular at the time. And I had an outfit that looked just like them dudes. Like, the mm. sleeves rolled up. Wow. Had the, 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 the shirt was open underneath, a little skinny tie, a little turquoise skinny tie, baggy jeans, you know, like, just super, like, Fresh, fresh. I was looking like NBC fresh. Okay. Wow. And I and my and my I was going and my dad was not trying to have it. He wasn't pastoring in, but he was a minister at this church. And I knew that he didn't want I guess he just didn't want no static from none of the other saints about him allowing me this young to express myself this way in fashion. Because this All is right. a worldly look. You feel me? This is yeah. this is the worldly look. <laughs> so my grandfather interceded for me. Sylvester Williams, rest his soul. He told my dad, he said, hey, leave that boy alone. Let him express himself. He ain't going to hurt nobody. He said, he's, he's a musician. He's an artist. He's expressing himself. And my grandfather was a painter. My grandfather mm -hmm. played sax, and he was also a chef. So he had multiple gifts. That's where I get all this stuff from. Right. And he interceded for me, and I got to rock my Miami Vice outfit for Easter. Nobody in that church had on no Miami Vice stuff. I was playing drums that Sunday. You couldn't tell me nothing, bro. I got <laughs> off of that drum set when it was time to switch um, guards, you know, because, you know, you, you couldn't just stay on the drums the whole service. You know, I was right. younger, so you had to cough it up, and you're like, no, someone else has to play now. And when I, they let me play a few more numbers because the outfit was so fresh, they didn't touch me, right? <laughs> 
So I so I get up off the drums and all the older drummers all give me dap like you did that boy you look at your outfit blah 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 you couldn't tell me nothing and then I looked over my dad I was like what's up and then he had to like admit I was right like it was a hit you know yeah. so but I I wasn't trying to be rebellious but I was like I don't see how me expressing myself has anything to do with the Holy Ghost I still feel and still rock in and. I don't love God any less because I like dope clothes. I just, I never understood that. And it's a lot of hypocrisy there because you know the old adage, you know, come as you are. Well, this is how I'm coming. <laughs> the Lord's still going to love me. And I'm not saying, I'm not an anarchist. I'm not saying come in there with some halter top, you know, burlap <laughs> two top or something. But, man, there's you bigger fishes to fry in church than clothes. I can tell yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so right? imagine, imagine trying to like work through that world, being an artist, but yet not trying to embarrass your parents. Yeah. Or trying, trying not to make your district elders or your bishops upset. Right. You know, or when you are representing California, going to a national convention. Did you hear what blah 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 was wearing? And, and he from your state. You need to get him together. And state bishops calling, complaining, and it, it, people never know like the things that I had to go through just to make it easy for cats to just basically show up however they want to. Now, as a gospel artist, you can pretty much do you express yourself as an artist. But it took people like Donald Lawrence, myself, Ty Tribbett. Sir, and Mary Mary, fashion wise, Trinity Five Seven, fashion wise, like yeah. it, I just don't feel like they got enough credit for what they did at the time. But you are all the new kids on the block. That you, you guys represent the shift in gospel music, right? Young yeah. people ate it up. Young yeah. people ate it up. We had no problems with. I felt like when I saw Stomp, and that was right before Pronounced On Eight came out. I was actually right before I signed my deal to record Pronounced On Eight is when mm -hmm. I saw Stomp. The follow-up video was Spirit by Sounds of Blackness featuring Craig Mack. Mm. So imagine watching Stomp for the first time. You didn't even know Salt was going to be rapping in it. The video right. looks like an MTV budget quality. You know, nobody was at the hospital dying. Nobody was about to, you know cry over some bills and drinking because the bills are too heavy. Like, those are most gospel videos, right? So right. for me to see Kirk Franklin with, you know, an actual 35 millimeter with some cranes and some, you know, it just, it's like, what? And it was promoting you to dance. It was promoting you to dance. Yeah. 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 I, I personally needed that validation as a gospel, urban contemporary gospel artist at the time. Mm. We didn't have many examples in 97. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, you know, when they, they used to actually play Stomp in the club, I felt convicted. Oh, yeah. Like, I can't dance to this song in here. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is religious. Can't do that. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would go to the bar and get a drink. Mm -hmm. You're like, I can't do this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, how is the record label with you during this time? Like, I know the record labels, please, because of your art, but then the record label versus the church, like, how are you in between? What is the language? Great questions. Never been asked these things before. It's good. Um, labels sign me for one thing, but then they try to pasteurize you into some type of, I don't know, commodity for them. It's like, they, okay, this is you, but now let's iron this out for our pipelines to make it make sense. Mm. When you didn't sign me for it making sense. Mm. You signed me because it was so different from all that stuff you guys were doing that this stood out and you picked it up, you know, because I stuck to my guns. I, I'm, I'm not saying record labels don't know what they're doing. They are a, a, an excellent tool when it comes down to radio marketing and press and all those different types of things. The muscle that you need, the wind beneath your wings can come from a major label. I'm not, I've had good times and bad times with them, but mostly good, all right? At that time, I was still signed to 
uh, a local label in San Diego, well, South Bay, uh, Southern San Diego. And it was called Rescue Records. And a rock group called P.O.D. was actually signed. The drummer's father was the owner of that label, Noah Bernardo. And Ruben Torres was my A&R. And I was still independent. I had distribution with Diamante Distribution at the time. Um, that meant I was in all Christian bookstores of all kinds around the world for the first time. Not a major deal yet, but this okay. is the first time my music I made in my bedroom could be heard around wow. the world, at least in Christian stores. Right. Family okay. Christian bookstore, Berean Bible bookstore, or Life Lighthouse, or God's World, or whatever mm -hmm. these different places might be that's specified in gospel catalogs and, you know, product. I'm finally able to, whoever goes in can get it now. They don't have to just see me if I brought my product to this visiting church or I'm coming in for this concert and you can get my product there. So it's basically my own distribution vicariously through the gig. No more of that. This is the first time whether I did a gig or not. <laughs> wow. They all can get it. Wow. This was a major deal. If I hadn't went any further than that, brother, at that time, just being able to be in every Christian bookstore, I thought I made it because no one else in my city had made it that far yet. Not gospel wise. Wow. So this was a first in my city, not just for my career, but it hadn't happened yet. We hadn't had any major signings in gospel. Or and how ever. old are you at this time? How old are you when this is happening? 21. Wow. Yeah. Major. I was really ahead. Like my mind was already where I'm at right now back then. Like I already knew it was going to be something like this. I didn't see the, the B Slay transition coming, but I did see myself being very, very involved in TV, film, sync licensing and producing other acts, even mm -hmm. back then. I just wanted to get in myself so that I could kind of like create a lane for my own sound, kind of like how Jay Moss did. Like when Jay Moss produced, you know, Karen Clark's finally Karen album, it, yes, Karen killed it, but it was all because of Jay Moss. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it, it so I, I felt like a camaraderie with him in that sense that he shifted culture with a whole new sound. It wasn't just like he did a bomb album nothing sounded like Jay Moss. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like nothing still, you know, you know, specifically that yes. nobody but Jay Moss. Right. I respect people that have such a signature that it cannot be denied in a world today that's so blurred with people who sound exactly alike. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with being on trend. Don't, don't get it twisted. I love what's happening trend wise. I'm not one of them cats that romanticizes the 90s. I mean, I love where music is at right now. I love how I'm doing things now. But there has to be some type of some type of feeling or connection, brother. Like if 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 I don't feel it, why am I selling it to you? Right. And pronounced Tone was such a avant-garde album. I was wasn't sure if the Christian bookstores was gonna carry it. Because one of the first lines of the album is, nigga, don't test me. You'll be feeling crunchy like some Nestle. <laughs> I'll be popping caps and demons aspirin. I know you're jeweling off my beats. Here's a napkin. <laughs> I got the jump for the East and the West Coast. I got a new kind of blunt called the Holy Ghost. Shekinah glory making fumes. You just might choke. I was like, they ain't going to play this. But they went for it. They but that's playing. right there when when your when your record company heard that for the first time, what was their response to you? Record Rescue Records didn't mind the edge because they were okay. an edgy label anyway. They already had like punk rock Christian bands that was already like he is the Lord of the God. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think if I'd been signed to a black label, it would have happened. Honestly, yeah. If it was a traditional black label, I don't think pronounced they would have come out. I don't. Rescue Records wasn't afraid to let me express myself as an artist because P.O.D. was they was playing mainstream clubs long before they got signed to Atlantic Records. 
long before the Satellite album. You know what I'm saying? So Bresky Records, I have to give it to them. They signed acts that love God that were edgy, that were controversial. And I wouldn't be here talking to you today about it if they if I had a went to a regular traditional gospel label at that time, they would have totally been like, absolutely not. You better clean this up or we're just not putting this out, period. Right. Then once major labels start seeing after this Christian indie major put this out that people liked it and it starts right. selling out, then all of the other labels, we want you now, blah, 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 you know? So once you once the record is out and, and you you have to go tour after it or perform, do you notice that your crowd changes a little bit or where you go changes a little bit? Yes, because Rescue Records was the first person who intru introduced to me concert writers mm. and technical writers. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know that you could be like, I'll say, I'll say this, they opened up doors for venues that I probably would not have been booked in because it would have only been traditional black churches. I got booked in a lot of CCM stuff a lot of mainstream rock stuff that was not Christian. I used to go to I used to go to underground hip hop joints and do songs from pronounced on a in the middle of a hip hop crowd and smash and have the whole crowd rocking with me. Wow. So they didn't have no problem. They they fanned those flames for me. They fought the majors when the la the majors came in to do more marketing and distribution trying to take over and homogenize the album. Mm -hmm. They fought for the majority of my artistry to remain intact contractually so that what I was presenting would not be tainted with too much. Because that's the whole reason why y'all signed me is because the streets started talking about it. So why you want to change it now? You know, and once they saw it sell, it all changes and they all take credit for it. Yeah, this was our bright idea. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, y'all didn't even believe in it. But now that it's working, y'all ready for pictures and ready to celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So who was the first person that came to you and asked for your help? Like, can you make me sound uh, like that? Can you, can you bless my, my uh, gift yep. with your Who was the first person? I was just with him last night uh, at Gordon Campbell's live recording for conversations, Eric Dawkins. Mm. Eric Dawkins of the group Dawkins and Dawkins, who J Moss also produced this dope song. Have y'all ever heard this song called Child of God by Dawkins and Dawkins, produced by J Moss with the jam? One of the best songs ever, like tightest songs ever, ever made. They wanted a remix for this song um, called Need to Know, Need to Know, Need to Know, now. God, No, Need to Know, God. So I was like, okay, cool. I love Dogs and Dawkins. I found out about them through Fred Hammond because they used mm. to <clears throat> produce with him and tour him and write with him and things. They gave me the acapellas. I did a house version and that was my first kind of mainstream placement. Uh, Raina oh. Bundy at, at Harmony Records. And they gave, those guys gave me my first, first shot at a remix. And then came, who was right after that? Nancy Jackson. That was wow. the next. That was the next major production thing I had as a result of the sound of pronounced Tone at the time. Wow. Yeah. That's What's awesome. up, Pep? I see you, Pep. <laughs> see, and, and you're making relationships during this time. So you're networking and you're meeting more people. You're growing your brand, pretty much. Yes. Then what? Like, then I get a call from Hezekiah Walker because P Diddy played pronounced tone for him mm -hmm. and i think at the time bad boy gospel was just about to start popping there was a season where where diddy was actually going to do a gospel brand and they had a video off of this song called thank you and it was supposed to be like bad boy gospel and i at the time he was interested in me coming on board for that so hezekiah reached out to me and I just remember being very excited because that call came right after the Dawkins and Dawkins call. So it was like things just started happening. But this was as a result of people finally being able to get a hold of my music outside of my own city. Wow. That's why, that's why it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter what the album's about as long as people know it's there. It's like you can have all the distribution in the world, but if no one knows to go get it, you're just taking up shelf space. 
So right. you producing for other people helps to create brand loyalty and equity for future endeavors because people begin to trust how consistently you blaze or produce records. Very I'm true. in that trajectory right now because of the consistency of I don't make flops. You know what I mean? I don't go into it to fail. I go into it to push number ones out after one after the other. Not that I need to be number one. I just want to be number one to myself. I want to give God my best and then I want to give the people my best. But it started with being able to cultivate the production, people nodding to you saying, hey, I see what you're doing. I hear where you're going with this. Come on over here and blaze me with some of that. It, it, it helps you feel like your work and your labor and the, and the bullets and, the, and, the, and the, the jabs was all worth it. You know, it, yeah. it validated me at that time. That's what's up. That's what's up. And I, yeah. I ask you these questions because uh, one, I'm it's a geek. And I'm, a fan. <laughs> I'm a geek and I'm a fan, and I, I always ask questions from a fan's perspective. But also, two, I, I think that inspiration is the root of everything. And I think that for someone who is looking to be a part of, get into learning how to watch their own flower blossom. They're learning from these conversations that, that we have. Mm -hmm. And I always say art matters and great art inspires. Absolutely. And if you stories behind them, it can help you on your trajectory. So. Absolutely. You can see what not to do. <laughs> not just what to do. You can see yeah. what not to do. Exactly. You know, the, most of my journey these days, brother, has been unlearning. Mm. My own personal ideologies got in my way. Not religion. Mm -hmm. My own personal mantras and ideologies, idiosyncrasies. Yeah. You know, we, we have our little hangups about what our absolutes are. Not realizing right. every 10 years that changes. Yeah. The things I said I would never, ever do 10 years ago, I've done it. And they change whether you want them to or not. Correct. <laughs> Called survival. Yes. Adaptation, yeah. evolution. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? People... People who are saved are scared to say the word evolution, but I am the same guy in my heart, but I have evolved as a man. Yeah. You know, you go back to when you was 21, you're not the same dude. No. <laughs> and it would be problems if I was. You know, what, what, what have I been doing? <laughs> what have you been learning? What have you been witnessing? How have you been living? <laughs> that part. Yeah. That part. Yeah. Yeah. So, so take me to the birth of B. Slade. Mm. Okay, so after everything that happened, I got blacklisted and everything. Uh, the Lexi interview comes out and everything's canceled. And I'm like, okay, I want to keep going. So can, let, let's pause right there for a second because we're in this cancel culture, right? And, and you were kind of like way before that wave, way, way, yes. way before that wave. Very, very good observation. <laughs> <laughs> talk about because I don't think people really understand what that consists of and I want you to expound on the effects of what that does to your life when mm. art is your livelihood talk about that a little bit let's just say if Donald Lawrence was not Donald Lawrence not only would I not be here physically today the legacy that you're speaking of now would have never existed he intercepted suicide for me a couple of times mm. Mm. Donald Lawrence paid my mortgage mm. a couple of times He didn't ask me to say nothing. It's been years since he's done it. But had he not stepped in and got me the help books and therapy and love and restoration he brought me, I would not be living today. People will I, I never know, know what that aspect of my life, when you're making a certain amount of money, when you are known a certain type of way and everyone in your whole city 
let alone your family, turns on you. Mm. Overnight, acting shocked about something y'all had to have always known if you grew up with me. So mm. this is what we're doing right now. We're going to pretend to be full shocked that I'm keeping it a buck about what you've always known, especially through my music. In the name of the Lord, though? I don't know. It was kind of weird. It was kind of weird. Um, Donald Lawrence was instrumental in renewing my faith in other colleagues in the gospel industry. And shout out to Donald Lawrence right now. Shout out Donald Lawrence. That's strong. He's uh, in the industry, but he's not of it. He's right. quite mysterious. I get a lot of my mystery and enigma <laughs> from, from, from Donald Lawrence and, and Janet. You know, but we're, we're all kind of not trying to hide anything. It's just I find out that I have less obstruction when no one knows what to obstruct. Yeah. Um, people got new. And I understand. It's, it's, it's no, you know, obviously I came out with the victory, you know, but at the time it was quite embarrassing and humiliating. Yeah. It was humiliating. It was humiliating. And you're still young at that point. Like, you're, you're yeah. a young man going yeah. through all this. Yeah. And, and then, you know, no one... so to have that, your, that part of your career happen and it, it kind of made me reanalyze everything. So I was like, if I continue on as Tone, the first thing that's going to pop up on, on all the, through all the algorithms and all the search engines is this particular thing because it was the thing that got the most attention, but it shouldn't have got the most attention. My art should have got the most attention. My craft should have got the most attention. My, my diligence with quality work should have gotten the attention, but it was a different world then. Instagram wasn't even out yet. You know what I'm saying? It was a different world then. MySpace was still popping at the time. Yeah. It was a different world then. I'm going to share something with you that you probably don't remember. So I, I, have, I work for another show. I actually produce it. It's called The Stephen Knight Show. And I had reached out to you to be a part of that show to do an interview then. And this was in, like, you were fresh into Be Slave. Yes. Fresh. And um, I think when I went through your people, they, they gave me this list. And they were like, we're not talking about this. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about this. And me being the person that I was, I understood where you were coming from. And so I was like, well, maybe this just isn't the right time. Maybe I'll just wait, and then I'll let him get into Be Slave a little bit more. But, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that you were firm on that, because you were building yourself back up. And yeah. Thank you for seeing that. Thank you for seeing that. That was it, 2010. It happened, it happened when it was supposed to happen. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I feel like, in retrospect, the man I've become, the man you are, we both lived a little bit, and we're able yeah. to reflect on some of these career choices uh, that were made for me. It was not yeah. my intention to go on that show and for that to happen. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So no. it's kind of like I didn't plan like, oh, I'm going to go on there and I'm going to say this and this is what it's going to be. No, I mm. kind of got sideswiped and I just dealt with it, rolled with the punches. But that yeah. meant I had to start all over again because at that time, Tone had become box office poison. Mm. Yeah, that, that canceled thing. They major. canceled me out. I had no money. Lost furniture, repossessed cars, struggling. Just, it was a really bad time. So I went to New York and, well, we're skipping a very important part. The New Yorker article came out in February of 2010. And when that article came out, I had a 10-page article in the New Yorker, which was unprecedented. I couldn't even believe I was in the New Yorker in 10 pages, let alone that. Okay, so they go through my whole thing and, you know, and this director named Alan Poole who made one of my favorite shows of all time, Swingtown, only one season. I, I could just strangle CBS for that. Good show. He reached out and said, I'm working on this new movie project. 
There's a couple of movies I want you to watch. One of them is called The Velvet Goldmine. Mm. It says, the movie project that I'm going to work with you on uh, is going to have similar look or style to the way this was put together. So in that story, it, it, uh, Velvet Goldmine, there was this artist who was like on the folk side of things or like very eccentric rock side of things. And the music community wasn't receiving him. So he ends up rebranding himself as this rock star named Brian Slade. Mm -hmm. And he takes over the world and blows up. So I saw that and I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to rebrand myself as this fictitious character and start all over again. So I called Alan Poole, had him call the director of said movie. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, could I use this fictitious name as my stage name? And they gave me their blessing. So B Slade is short for Brian Slade. And basically, every time you hear me sing, dance, act, rap, preach, whatever, you will be Slade. You know, it's just a play <laughs> on words. Yeah. And it started in 2010. My first show was at the Greenhouse. Shout out to Joey Harris, uh, who booked me for that. And that was me introducing myself as B Slade or Brian Slade. And I got dressed in a... Uh, a, a bathroom stall next mm. to somebody taking a dump. I went from having my own rooms and my own suite and my own this and all that to in a bathroom. And I said to myself, I said, don't worry, man, because this dude was blowing it up next to me. It was like the lowest somebody could have been humiliation wise that your dressing room was next to somebody who's. Yeah. And I especially said, especially hey, coming man, from where you came from. Especially came where I came from, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I told myself before I went upstairs, because the bathroom was downstairs, I said these words. I said, don't worry, man. Tonight's the night you start digging yourself out of this. Mm -hmm. You're going to get out of this. And that was the night I started digging myself out as, as B. Slade. And now 20, well, 10 years later, 12 years later, uh, we went in and it worked. You know, but I had to, I knew if I didn't change that brand, I was never going to get out of the the algorithms that that controversy caused for me and my family. I don't think people really know how much it it had a rift in our family. Wow. When you, when you, when, when people interview folks and they just go for the juggler and, you know, just, you know, for the ratings, they yeah. don't understand the trauma that comes the family dynamic. That, it, it, that's major. But I don't think people actually even really realize what the whole canceling thing really consists of and how you're icing people out of just life. Like you said it yourself, like you were at the edge. Like it drove you there. Yeah, I felt major. like I wouldn't have a fair shot to be taken seriously if I was the poster boy for this situation. Right, right. It was, it felt like if I didn't start over, I was going to end. And I didn't want my chapter to end that way. I didn't want right. to be mad. He, man, he has so much potential. And he, man, he was right there on the edge and didn't make it. I just knew, bro, if I didn't make that change and move to LA and just start all over again, mm -hmm. they was going to bury me there. People, people to this day cannot believe I'm, I'm kicking, looking good, winning. They thought they, they didn't have to deal with me no more. Yeah. They was happy. Some people wanted my demise. And that's no, what I never understood I yeah. about that. I never understood why people wanted me to commit suicide. Someone was disappointed that I didn't. Wow. Wow. These are, you know, and I get, you know, I get religion has people thinking you're saying the right thing. I used to say a lot of things out of religion thinking I was doing the right thing because I was just what I was raised in. Right. But I think people now, when they look back on that time in my career in life, many people regret the way that went down. And they've apologized and said, I don't have no hard feelings. I'm not bitter. I'm better. But it does feel good to know people know that was kind of fucked up how that went down. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about my French. But yeah. I actually promote that. That's fine. Yeah. All right. <laughs> wow. And I, I, I talk to people a lot about um, um, Janet Jackson, for example. 
somebody canceled. They canceled her out. She was gone for a period of time. Gone. Yeah, and she Similar. decided to live life. She used the time to live her life, have a baby, get mm -hmm. married. Mm -hmm. so her climbing her way back yep. and doing it in style. You're and I mean clean. <laughs> I'm happy with all the moves, the fashion moves, the team got yep. her going, that fashion. Just, uh, she's been through so much. Shout out to Tyler Perry also for him looking out for her during those dark years. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people give him enough credit for making sure Janet stayed relevant during that time with Why Did I Get Married, Why Did I Get Married to, and uh, for Colored he, Girls, just. He was her Donald Lawrence. Absolutely. That's what I was thinking in my head, but you said it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. I mean, and I always loved him for that. He never let them disrespect her. And, you know, that was a hard time, man. I, I, I can relate to her on the being canceled, but. I also can relate to her as a tourist that we're very determined people. Oh, you know? you're a tourist? Yeah, we, me and Janet have the same birthday, May 16th. Janet I'm and I have the same birthday. But then, oh my God, okay, it's no wonder why we get along. And Donald <laughs> Lawrence is up in there too. Okay, okay. And Shanice, Shanice and Stevie Wonder, so we're in good company. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but wow. me and Janet have the same birthday and you a day after me and Janet, that's pretty cool. Yep. So, Auntie Shirley Ralph says that y'all were only supposed to do one song and it turned into an album. What happened? She first it was like, I just want to do a Christmas song. And then it turned into like, she tried to talk me out of it too. She was like, well, can't they, can't we just do, you know, she gets, you know, her shoulders go, can't we just do an EP? I don't think I have the time to do a full album. I was like, <laughs> you can listen. I was like, look, I'll, can you just give me, I said, can you just give me a couple of hours out of your day? Because she has to get up at like four in the morning, grab it over. She got, got a lot going on. She got a lot going on. And so at first it, it was kind of difficult to get a hold of her. <laughs> then after she won, I don't know how we got this album done. Honestly, I really don't. After she won, trying to get a hold of her to come to the studio was virtually Listen. impossible. I think after she won, I think after she won, it was a straight step off the stage onto a locomotive. Like yes, she was just... she's... <laughs> so I had to end up going to she has a uh, a production studio in the back of her crib. So I would go over there, take my mobile studio over there to finish the album because there was just no way between her schedule and my schedule that we were gonna meet up at the studio that we were working out of Plush Boy. Mm -hmm. So we would record sometimes way out west and sometimes up north depending on what location or what day she was shooting or because sometimes they'd add stuff we think she had a day to record and they'll add some new stuff right at the end of the day that she has to stay there for so that mm -hmm. session that i had you know all set up now it's it's gone so i have to do that to work on something else so what i would do was when i couldn't get her i would do prophetic post-production <laughs> I would, I would anticipate the things that she probably was going to have to do later and handle all those things around her, musician-wise, arrangement-wise, mixing-wise, mm -hmm. getting things done, uh, credits, metadata, things of that nature, you know? So just, it, it was a learning experience. I don't ever want to be painted into a corner that way again, but <laughs> you can't tell success how to lead you. How about that? You can't pray for it and then say, well... Let me be successful, but I want to tell you how I want you to help me succeed. No, once success comes, you got to kind of like go with, because you don't know how long that's going to last. Yeah. So you have to methodically say, okay, now that I've blown up on Real Housewives, Nene Leak says, I'm going to flip this into sitcoms. I'm going to flip this into Broadway. I'm going to flip this into Las Vegas. I'm. Gonna, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so she didn't want to do the full record. But I was like, Miss Ralph, you might as well just go ahead and, and give these people some. She's like, well, I want it to be edgy. I don't want it to be the normal type of thing. Like Little Drummer Boy, I want it to be something for the clubs. And I just, you know, I was like, I got you. I got you. I can do all of that. Okay, I got it. So now that you hear the album, all those things that you hear that are super edgy and just different, that wasn't me coercing, coercing her to do that. That was her wanting to be edgy. She wanted to have an urban edge. She wanted it to have some trap elements. She wanted the 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 gully aspect of it. So I, I just applaud her. There for are some of those aspects that. in. There. I will say this: 
and listening to it, it was like, it's Christmas music, right? All I could think about is decadence. It was, it's mm, very- I love that word. Very, <laughs> very, very thick, very sweet, very cognac-y. It's, yes. it's very- Smoky. It's a yeah. dark liquor. It's definitely a dark liquor. Like yeah. Dark liquor. yeah. Very sweet, like an yeah. amaretto, like yep. thick. Yep. Yeah. Because her contralto requires it. Yeah. You know, they heard her singing on the Emmys. I mean, you'll hear her sing like that on something like, oh, come let us adore him or something. You'll hear her sing in that register. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I had her in the cut. I had her pulled back on some T-Boz, Tony Braxton type stuff. Yeah. 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 I like, I love Miss Ralph's lower register. So I yeah. just, I fan those flames. And she's yeah. already sultry. Like she's just got this like sexy vibe about her anyway. So there was no way we're going to make this album without that attribute of her. She, she's a gorgeous woman, a black woman. And I just felt like we needed to make a nothing to take, not taking away anything from Mariah. She has that on lock. That year after year, that's her lane. That particular song, that is her thing. It's cemented. It's never going nowhere. Yeah. We're not trying to compete with that or even be compared to that. This is like, let's just do something for the streets. I just wanted to make a Christmas record or a holiday record that would be in every black household. That was my goal. I wanted yeah. to make something so black. I wanted, it, I wanted it to be blackity black, black. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And it was. It was it's it's so um alternative, but to the black alternative. What's the song where, where they're talking about where she's talking about um like at a Christmas party? And she said something about we're gonna go play a game of spades. We're gonna yeah, do so something. She goes, she goes, um, we be playing Uno and things, taboo and things. Yeah, <laughs> life yeah. ain't so bad at all, you know. Yeah, yeah. Like, like she and the and wait till you see the video because I'm I'm actually editing that. It's due tonight. Uh, it's gonna be making its debut on television for the first time. But just seeing her get excited like a little kid, like just seeing her hear herself back sounding good yeah you know like yeah she's like i don't know how i'm gonna how i'm gonna do this and i don't you know she was very very like she wanted to do the album but she didn't want to be pushed to the point where she had to really dig in to like start singing yeah. in a new way yeah but i wouldn't let up i wouldn't when let she up off her. some of the tracks back what was her reaction oh when she i played uh slay for her first i came mm -hmm. to her house uh uh, Norman Lee, co-executive producer, he facilitated it because she told him that she wanted a holiday album. Do you have a producer that you think could make it sound edgy? He's like, I sure do. You need to get me played. So that's how this happened. So he arranged a meeting for me to go over to her house. And I said, I feel like, Miss Ralph, the album should be called Slay. She goes, mm. <laughs> Slay, honey. You know, You know, she's very like, She's so opulent, decadent, as you yes. say. Yes. So I guess what I was trying to do was give her the black edginess that 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 were the were the beauty shops and the barber shops give her that hood Grammy. Mm -hmm. But it's also plush trap. It's it's a sheen on top of plush the whole trap. album. Like that. that plush like trap that. or editorial trap, you know, very mm. plush. And even the cover, you know, she she let me do the art direction for that. She didn't. What's interesting that is she summer. didn't get in the way of anything that I was doing artistically. She let me really just go ahead and create. That cover looks like what the album sounds like. Sounds like. That's what I was going for, brother. That's all Perfect I match. wanted. Perfect match. I come from a time when I would buy someone's album just off the way the cover looked. Or one yeah. of the song's titles was so intriguing. that I'm like, I'm buying this album because what is this song about? Mm -hmm. I miss that. Her booklet, bro, is so amazing. For those of you who don't know, Shirley Ralph, you get it off of iTunes, there is a PDF booklet that comes with it. When I tell you it is stellar, stunning, all of the pictures, the credits, the lyrics, all the stuff we used to sit down and read, I encourage you, please download that booklet, man. We put so much work into it, man. It's, it, when you sit down with the album and look at the credits and listen to it and read at the same time, man, it's, there's nothing like it, especially during wow. Christmas time. Yeah, you you you're giving us an experience. That's an experience. Yes. That's what yes. I'm used to having with music is a whole experience. It should be. 
You should remember not, the day an album many, came out. Nah, there's a smell when you open up the the vinyl, when you open up the CD, that mm -hmm. fresh booklet smell, like this is your copy. It becomes personal to you. Yeah. Yes, millions of copies were sold, but this is my copy. You know, it, it gets mm -hmm. very personal. Yeah. Yeah. So you and I have a mutual friend, uh, Miss Faye Renee. Who? Uh, Faye Renee. Faye Renee Evans. <laughs> yes. I thought she was... <laughs> I thought she was, I was like, I don't know her Faye Dunaway. I was like, now that I know. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Street was herself sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was talking to her about that, it was the, uh, I think it was the Incomparable Project, where it was more, it was um, a concept album. And yes. I gave her kudos on that because not she did that in a time where people had stopped doing that. Doing concept albums, yeah. Thank you for bringing that back. Mm-hmm. Your thoughts, because I have this conversation all the time with um, various people about R&B and, and where R&B is now. And you did say earlier that you like where the music is now. Mm -hmm. But some people don't like where the music is now. And mm -hmm. they want the reminiscent of how music was in the 90s. Share your thoughts on that with me. I understand the romanticizing the 90s, but I listened to a lot of 90s stuff and it was trash. We just mm. liked it back. We liked it back then because we was just hype and didn't know no better. But you go back and listen to some of them vocals. Yeah. It was a mess. It was a hot. Yeah. I'm sorry, bro. I don't care. That's my jam. If you really listen to it. Whoa. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't that good. You know, yeah. so I, I think what they're saying is the times back when people would put whole projects together and, and smart people got together and put together a whole concept it wasn't just let me just throw some songs together yeah. you knew they worked with one producer or two producers to give a cohesive sound to the overall project i think that's what people are saying they're missing these days albums feel like a bunch of throwaway songs that just got thrown together they don't even make any damn sense they sound good they all bops they all singles but there's no thread yes there's and, no reason for me to be engulfed in the continuity of the story arc of the album, let alone the story arc of a song. Right. Because all the songs start to sound like one long damn ass song. That's part of the problem. The R&B albums now sound like one long ass sad song. Yeah. I like and vibey shit. I like vibey. I I'm do that too. dude too. I'm there. But not... I, like I feel like I'm drowning every album i feel like it's i'm in a lava lamp every album i'm i'm <laughs> struggling just to get on dry land <sighs> I, don't, I like I don't, it you know it's in, it's in my music too but i try to expand and expand on the sound not just drown in the sound like i like the trap sound i like the arm sound i like the wavy sound but i also wanted to have like some lyrics and some like i like when I listened to Scissor's album this morning, I was just like, wow, she's actually rapping better than like rappers. Mm. On some, it's like, it's just everything's it's like an alternative universe right now. It's just like rappers sing better than singers and singers are rapping better than rappers. So it's just like some kind of alternative universe right now. I don't know what's going on. It was crazy. I, know, I, think, I think the space that I'm in, I don't, I, like I'll catch a vibe off someone and then it makes me, intrigued about them so i'll go to look at some other things and i'm like well they're not giving me the same vibe i'm not getting the yeah. same the same feeling right or you know it, it, with certain people it's it sounds to me like they may have lost the talent like okay you give me all of this on this mm -hmm. track mm -hmm. but then i'm listening to five other ones where's that vibe? like where is, are you talented they, yeah are did you they, not did, 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 where they go from yeah 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 because usually if someone really has it even if it's not to that extent on every song, there's still remnants of that brilliance, even right. in a casual way throughout the continuity of the album. Right. And that's the part that makes me feel like either someone dope came in and ghost wrote that shit and they didn't have the budget for the other songs, but something's rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> I Thank you very too. much, Paige Turner Unlimited. Last night was incredible at East West Studios with Gordon Campbell. Eric Dawkins. It was crazy. That was crazy last night. I had a lot of fun. Oh, that's what's up. Yeah, that was just last night. I was looking forward to today because when I see the word conversation,
conversation. I have a song called Conversation. Anytime I see conversation, that means mature people talking about sometimes uncomfortable things in a very casual way, in a very yes. adult way. Even yeah. if I don't agree, I don't have to get stupid and ignorant and talk to you like you're dumb. That's right. a conversation. I hear you, you hear me. It's not one-sided. It's not you running it. It's not me running it. We are talking. And so yeah. I just appreciate the questions you're as asking me from a journalist standpoint. I've never been asked these questions. I just appreciate you not doing your homework and, and giving me something else to think about. I just appreciate that. Yeah, I try not to um, repeat. And if, if I do, it's, it's purely coincidental. And I share with someone else not too long ago, I don't really prepare, not in the way that people think. Same, I, same. Like I, said, I come from a place of, of fandom. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking questions, you know, from a pure place. Mm -hmm. You know, I would say, why is the sky blue? Why is it, why did the right, waves right. crash? <laughs> you know, why did they get from right, me when right. they hit the hand? You know, I was that kid. Right. So I ask questions because I genuinely want to know the answer. And, and it comes from a place of passion. And I'm, dude, you're so dope. Like you're like one Thank of you, the brother. dopest male singers ever. You have a Rochelle Pharrell quality about you. That's who you are to me. Thank you, brother. That's an honor. <laughs> She's incredible. An alien. <laughs> She's incredible. Alien is the right word, but that's an honor. Yes. That's yeah. She's yeah. amazing. Wow. Who Who are some people that you listen to? Give me, give me, um, I'll go 10 people. I won't say five. I'll go 10. This girl named Ash. Um, she has an album called The Perfect EP. Um, she's actually going on, she's going to be opening Duran in Cleveland soon. Um, her name's Ash, A-S-H. I think you guys will like her. Okay. I'm listening to her a lot. Um, of course, I'm listening to the SZA album just dropped. Uh, who else am I listening to? Daniel Caesar. I love Daniel Caesar. Mm -hmm. The Freudian yeah. album is excellent. I listen to a lot of Channel Orange. To this day, a lot of Frank Ocean, but that particular album, it just gives me the vibes and feel I, I need, especially during the fall, summer going into fall. Yeah. Yeah. Who else am I listening to? Um, it might shock some people. My playlist is very, very diverse. I listen to a lot of lo-fi hip-hop and study lo-fi, stuff that doesn't interfere with my thoughts where I can still write things and do things. It's there to give me the mood I need but it's not mm -hmm. interfering with uh, my conduit, you know. Got you. Yeah. What's your, your, your space for writing? What do, you, what do you need? Do you need to have an environment? Do you need to go a certain place? Colors are important. Colors are yeah. important to me, like lighting, mood, mm -hmm. um, what's on my screen. When I worked on uh, Miss Ralph's album, uh, I had the best pictures of, that I'd seen in her you know, recent catalog of, of, of photographs that she had. I put them up as a storyboard. I try to find out how do I make this song sound like that picture? You know, so my songwriting for her on this album had a lot to do with just having her various pictures in front of me, not just writing some because I can do it and it's dope and she's just going to do it. No, I, whoever I'm working with, I study. For myself nice. personally, I just sit down. Uh, I either pick this mic right here, AKG, or I'll use like the Shure mic. And when I sit down and I hear the music, it literally tells me which consonants, which vowels, which phonetic cadences to lean towards, whether it's A, E, I, O, U. I may not know mm -hmm. the full word, but I'll know that this chord requires an O or an E or an A type sound. And then I just, mm -hmm. I don't think, I used to write all the time, but now I just sit down and I listen to the music when I'm ready to receive what it wants to tell me. Because mm. <laughs> sometimes we go and saying, this is what this song's about. And yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and you just start to force feed what this is supposed to be. And this is like, actually, this song ain't nothing about that. Yeah. I want it, the music tells you, this is what I want to say. So that's what the process has been lately. When I do write, I write inside of a magazine. I'll write inside of a, an architectural book. I'll mm. write inside of Vogue magazine. Artists that work with me, we get a, okay. a nice little Sharpie and whatever picture inside of Vogue or inside of some, you know, 
I don't know, paper, magazine, whatever. We write out the lyrics on that. Just break all kinds of rules. I write on photographs in the house. If, if I was like, I want to put lyrics on this paint, this picture today. Yeah. You can't do that. You're going to mess up the picture. No, I won't. That's art. <laughs> right. So th that songwriting process becomes not a, pro a process. It becomes conduit. You are... Mm. You are a pipeline, a fiber optic cable for something that's coming through you, not from you. When you try to be clever and try to be cool, you come off corny as hell. But when you just ride the track, let it tell you what it wants, coming through the side door, and trust the lyric, melody, mm. Gucci. Yeah. Since you said that, do you have a muse? Yeah, I have a few muses. Uh... Unnamed muses, but they always give me what I need. Muses are very important. I have them. I have a few. Good. And they have been my muse for a while. But I have a nice. new muse. I have a new okay. muse. And that nice. new muse um, has allowed me to enjoy life outside of my gift. And when you do, when you have recreation and things that are outside of what you're good at that you're observing, the quality of your work, the quality of how you negotiate agreements, all gets better. Yeah, you know I'm a much better businessman now. Nice, very nice. Are you surprised how well Soleil is doing right now? Melba Moore, what's up, Melba? I was just talking about you. We have something to do. Um, I am not surprised at it happening i'm surprised at the amount that it's happening so successively but it's because i've been planting seeds for a really long time they're just now starting for the world to see the grass is poking through the soil a little bit now wait hold on pause is that the legend miss melba Moore yes in this room? yes that's why i just oh, I, I was melba like Moore. wait a minute <laughs> i love you i love you i love you i love you i, I love, love you too Moore. I met Miss Melba Moore at um, uh, Auntie Cheryl's uh, Diva Simply Singing in Philadelphia. And she's like such a sweet person. Such, such a, a sweet, sweet person. Mega talented lady. Miss Melba Moore, I want you on my show. I'm going to reach out to you. I want to talk to you. Cause Please do. She lived. She's, she she's, lived. She's batter up. Um, she and I have been, been talking about over a decade now. It's just a matter of schedules. But. It's about to happen. She even says, happy holidays, Slay. She knows what time it is. She keeps her eye <laughs> on me and always shows me love and support. So I plan on giving her the once over as well because she still has the pipes. Yes. The gift, the yes. spirit. And she's, she's so spunky. You know, I can work with somebody that got a little bit of spunk to them. You know what I mean? I like somebody with a little bit of bite. I need a little bit of edge on you, you know? So I'm looking forward yeah. to, to writing uh, with her like, some major hits. Miss Melba Moore will, will scream your face off. Yeah, and just hold it, and hold it, <laughs> yes. and hold it, and hold it, and hold yeah. it again. <laughs> She's still there. <laughs> so true. So true. So true. Yeah. So, Mr. B. Slade, are, is there anybody that you want to shout out? Uh, yeah, I would like to shout out uh, Rashad Holiday and Uncle Ro and... Kit Blackshire, uh, brother, uh, Shamari, Shonuff Wilson, yeah, Curtis Sauce Wilson, um, people that when I was still living in San Diego to come up to LA, also Phoenix White, who linked me to them. She uh, got me up there in LA before I was living up here, and I would drive up in. Those guys, it was like going to like a university for production and songwriting. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, ended up co-producing the, the, the title uh, track Slay with me. Mm. And it just is so full circle. Remember I was telling you about Jack Quest, my first production. Was, yeah. uh, all these people through the Slay project have all been coming back around saying how they were of me and how good it sounds and how the production, not just on one song, but the whole album is really good. So these are people who I really look up to and admire that have just been 
showing love, brother. It, it feels incredible to know that I have reached that place where they say, hey, man, you did a good thing. So That's I'm really up. excited about that. Shout out to Norman Lee, his co-executive producer. Uh, we also run Peerless Music together, which is the label, uh, Plush Boy Studios, uh, my new studio setup, which I can't wait for you guys to hear all the new material that's coming out of Plush Boy. Um, shout out to Shirley Ralph for trusting me, believing in me, and giving me this amazing opportunity for my music to be heard on the radio and on TV. And this oh, is the awesome. best Christmas I've had in a long time. With all of my losses, you know, parental mm -hmm. and grandparents and aunties and uncles and all those things, friends even that I've lost you know, through COVID and everything. This has been the best Christmas I've had in such a really, 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 really long time. Like, I'm genuinely happy. And every day of my life, I'm finally balanced and content with where I'm at. So nice. It just comes with time. Nice. Just in there. Everybody's yeah. got to hang in there and just keep believing in yourself and ignore adversity, man. Just ignore it. Don't, don't even stop to address the bullshit. Keep it pushing. That's all I can say. Like, when you stop to address that stuff, it, it slows you down. Mm -hmm. Just just stay laser focused on what God has for you and don't worry about anything else. And you'll be so surprised when you stop caring, 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 everyone starts caring. If you quit caring so much, everyone will start caring. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So um, shout out to Dietrich Haddon for putting me in. Um, uh, that was my first role where I got to play someone that was not necessarily a likable character. So that was a, that was fun to play kind of like a villain type. So that was fun. And uh, shout out to the Emmys for allowing me to open this year with uh, uh, Keenan, who opened, uh, what was that song? He did Friends. It was like a Friends nod. They paid a tribute to the show Friends and yeah. had me come in and do the the remix with, with uh, Uncle Rose. So I just want to say thank you guys. I appreciate y'all for giving me these amazing opportunities to share my gift. It's incredible. It's been a big year for me. It's been a great year for me. I'm happy for you, brother. It's your season. It's your time. Yeah. Again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, man. It is. It's, uh, when God knows you ain't going to fumble it, then you can handle it. Mm. You'll get it when you won't fumble. If you got it, you're not going to fumble. Something just came to me. You need to write a book. Think so? I do. I think you need to write a book. You, you have a lot to offer the world other than music, like your stories and your experiences. Uh, yeah. You have another offering. I would like, I think I would like that a lot. Yeah. I have a lot to say that just life lessons, man. Mm -hmm. Life lessons, man. I, I found now that I'm seeing the we're starting to manifest, it took every one of those ups and downs to create this lifeline I'm living. You know, like mm -hmm. that's what you see in the EKG machines, like a lot of ups and downs. That means life. Yeah. When it goes flat, that means you're gone. You know what I'm saying? So I thank God for every mountain, every valley, yeah. you know. They all help you to keep balance. I would say to those who feel like, why am I going and no one's paying attention to me? Step back and quit watching grass grow. Mm. You know, it will grow if you go do something else. <laughs> but if you're sitting there, it's going to look like nothing's happening, even though it is growing, but the, the process is so small and microscopic to the human eye that you're thinking nothing's happening in your favor. But if you go occupy, go do something else, yeah. if you go do something else you love to do outside of what you're good at doing, by the time you come back, you have some good news. You have a new opportunity. Somebody's waiting for you. But not if you're sitting there waiting for that pot to boil. You got to go do something else. If you sit there and watch it, it seems like it's just, it's never going to happen. Go do something else. Go serve somebody so that when it's your turn to be a CEO, you'll be treated right. 
Because however then, you follow, however you follow someone, when you're not in the level of power yet, however you treat your leaders, when it's your time to lead, that's how you will be treated. So make sure you serve right. Don't just lead right. Serve well. Yeah. And I just want to add something to that. When you when you go do something, whatever that something is, sometimes you find out you have a different set of nutrients on the on the journey there. You'll find other things that will fortify you on your way to where you really want to be. Absolutely. And you mm -hmm. won't find that unless it's as you go. Like people just want instantaneous healing, but even with the lepers, Jesus was like, as you go, as you mm -hmm. get ready to go tell this testimony, in that as you're to go tell this testimony, that's when the rest of this is going to be completed. It's in your yeah. motion. It's in the inertia of healing is inertia. When I cut myself, not immediately, but a few days later, my body says, oh, no, I need to heal myself. Mm -hmm. Healing is already in human beings. Mm -hmm. We are designed to heal ourselves, Right. So you won't find those nutrients, like you said, if you just keep staying in the same vicinity and the same area, the same peninsula, surrounding yourself with the same five people and you want different results. No. Yeah. yeah. I, had to, I had to make a few shifts. I've, I've had friends along the way that I have no problems with, but we're, we're just not. We are all different people now. Mm -hmm. And if you operate in guilt and if you have people around you that make you feel guilty for not talking to them every day or where you been, stranger, you might want to back away from them. My good friends, we just pick up where we leave off. That part. Wherever we were, we don't judge each other for how long it's been. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It's when it's time for us to talk, we're going to get together. And it's like we lost no time because those friendships are eternal. They're not based on Kiki and Ha Ha and every day. I don't have to do that. We, I love you already. I don't have to have so, that. I know where we stand. <laughs> Period. So anyway, enough of my rant. Y'all can find me on um, Instagram, B Slade now, obviously, B S L A D E now on Twitter, B S L A D E now on Snapchat, B S L A D E now on TikTok, B S L A D E now. I ain't gonna front. I'm not really on Facebook that much, but if you do want to go look, uh, it used to be late fans but i've deactivated all that i'm just not a facebook nigga i'm sorry but someday i guess i am vicariously through instagram but i'm just that's just not my my thing i think i read with instagram is my thumb getting those likes and, and and setting up all those different reels and posting and editing and all that stuff that's done more for me than doing concerts now it's really mm. incredible had i not had this technology i'm i could have rebranded the way Wow. that God has allowed me to rebrand. It took technology. Wow. The very nice. thing that sometimes divides us, if it's used in the proper way, can actually change the trajectory or reinvent your career without the assistance of any major corporation. And so true. just sitting around learning so the algorithms, I finally tipped the scale. We used to search for B. Slade. A lot of Tone A stuff used to come up. But if you look now, you'll see it's B Slade. And that took years to flip the algorithms, but it took my commitment, correcting people a few times, but you always tone to me. Well, guess what? We're probably not going to be because if you don't respect my Muhammad Ali, I'm not going to be sitting up here listening to you call me Cassius Clay all day. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> so right. those who can handle it can handle it. And I stuck to my guns and now we went in. Thanks be unto God, I didn't give up. I didn't kill myself. I don't look like what I've been through. That part. Thank you for this interview, brother. I'm so oh, happy. Thank you, be brother. Here. Thank you. Thank you for blessing me, and thank you for the conversation. Thank you for the education. And listen, you you always have an invite here on my forum. All right, I will be back with the next project after these messages. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, brother, and thank bless you so you. much. All right. Enjoy the holiday. You too. Oh, yeah, y'all, go Thank get you. Slay. Slay, the <laughs> album produced by yours truly by Shirley Ralph is available every, everywhere. All and get yourself, a, get yourself a yes. good yak. Get a yak get with yourself. that. Get a yak with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, brother. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Peace.